Today I'd like to talk to you about some of the major events in the civil rights movement. Now, whenever we do something like this, there, there's always going to be some, some, some stories we're going to leave out, some people we're going to leave out, and unfortunately with um, a class like we have where it's a survey of American history, we can only learn about some things. Now, I'd like to, to highlight a few things I think that are probably more well-known or maybe more influential, and that's what we're going to be, and I guess that's my disclaimer that I know that we're leaving out some, some good things and some important people, but uh, somehow we've got to... We've got to Make a cutoff somewhere. The first one that you might be familiar with is called the Born, the the Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. As you see here, there's six children. Now these six children, the families of these six children, wanted to be able to have their children attend what had previously been all white schools. They were better funded. There was better materials. There was more teachers, more qualified teachers. A, a number of things went into uh, into that decision. What you see here in the middle, now it gets its name Brown versus Board of Education from a young girl here. Now she's the girl in the middle right her, here. Her name is Linda Brown. And the reason why it's called Brown versus Board of Education, even though there were six children, was Linda Brown's name happened to come first alphabetically. So she got the designation. And that's who we remember is, is Linda Brown and, and her family. The Supreme Court overruled a previous decision, their, their own decision in the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. In that Plessy versus Ferguson, remember Homer Plessy was legally considered black. He was only one-eighth of African descent, but that was a legal definition of being black was one-eighth or more. He was not able to ride in a train that was segregated for white only. Well, when he took his case to court, the court said, no, you can have separate as long as they're equal. By this time, though, by 1954, the court had realized that, quote, separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, meaning that just because they exist means that they will be unequal. Now, as you'll see here, the court did not tell the states they had to integrate right away. They just said, I, I believe the language they used was in all due haste, but they never put a timeline on them, and it causes some problems. In 1955, the Emmett Till murder in 1955. Now, I'll try to tell these in, in, in small stories, and maybe you can connect these stories uh, so it might, it might make some sense of the civil rights movement. In 55, Emmett Till was a young boy. He was 14 years old, living in Chicago. He had some relatives in a small community called Money, Mississippi. Now, Money, Mississippi has not uh, historically been a place, if you're a person of color, that, that uh, you would see a lot of racial integration and uh, a lot of racial equality. Uh, while he was there, um, he was only there for a few days, and he was at a small convenience store in a very small town, a population of uh, 55 or 60 in the whole town. Uh, at the store, he whistled at the clerk. She was a white woman in her 20s. He whistled at her as he left the building. She got upset with him. She came chasing the boys out. Uh, it's reported that she had a gun with her. The important, a couple important things, within a couple days of this happening, this was a cultural violation that a black boy or a black man would whistle at a white girl. That was considered very threatening and, uh, and just a cultural violation that she just would not cross in Mississippi. Now, this woman, her husband and her husband's half-brother, uh, went to the house where Emmett was staying, kidnapped him in the middle of the night, uh, beat him to death, shot him in the head, and then to dispose of the body, they tied a 75-pound uh, fan around his body and, threw, and dumped him in a river. Uh, when the body was discovered, the coroner in Mississippi wanted to bury him. Uh, the mother, Mamie Till, said, absolutely not. You will send his body back to, Missis back to Chicago where I can bury him. Uh, she allowed uh, it to be an open casket funeral, so and it was attended by thousands of people in Chicago, so they could see what had happened to her son simply for whistling, for being a black boy and whistling at a white woman. Uh, Jet Magazine was a publication that most of their readers were black Americans, and they published the story of his murder, as well as published the, uh, the funeral pictures that you see here as well. Uh, the ter one of the most terrible things about this as well, too, is that justice wasn't even served. Um, uh, uh, not only was the boy killed, but the two men that committed the murder were, were brought to trial. The jury deliberated only about an hour. In fact, one of the jurors said they, they only took that long because they took time to, to order some Coke, some Coke or some Pepsi to drink to make it look a little better. Um, the, the murderers, because of something called double jeopardy, where you cannot be tried of the same crime twice, uh, within about four months of the trial, after being found innocent, they sold their their story to a, a magazine called Look Magazine, which would be something similar to um, maybe like People Magazine of today. And in that, in the interview, they detailed how they kidnapped him, how they killed him, and how they disposed of his body, and how they basically got away with, with murder. And for the rest of their lives, they, there was never any justice for his murder. That's the Emmett Till murder in 1955. Within about three or four months of the Emmett Till murder, there's a Montgomery Boyce boycott. As you see a picture here, this is Rosa Parks. 
and, and many of our school, uh, school age children know of Rosa Parks in elementary school. We learn of her. Um, a couple things about this. Uh, the story is simple enough that she wouldn't give a seat to a white man. Um, and one thing that I think is sometimes overlooked is that this was something that was done on an impulse. Um, uh, she was an intelligent um, woman who had planned this out. She was an activist and said, you know, in order for something to happen, I need to do something. And, and she saw this was a form of protest that she could do, knew she would be arrested for it, and knew she'd have a chance to challenge um, this practice. Uh, within that, when she was arrested, uh, several of the ministers in the area, including a young minister in his 20s, a gentleman by the name of Martin Luther King Jr., whose congregation was in Montgomery, they organized a bus boycott that lasted about a year, where all the black passengers said, we won't ride the buses, We'll use taxis, we'll carpool, we'll walk to work, we'll do what we need to, but we won't ride the buses. Um, and this was a language the bus company could understand because 65% of their income came from the black passengers on the bus. Like I said, it took about a year until finally the bus company said, okay, you know, we're losing enough money, we will, um, we will integrate the buses. Uh, desegregation at Little Rock High School. You know, we talked about... Brown versus Board of Education, that was in 54. This is in 1957, so three years later, you would expect to see um, people of color being able to attend whatever school they live closest to. Not the case in Arkansas. Several states, as well as many uh, cities, just did not do anything to integrate. Uh, there was nine students in 1957 that wanted to attend Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. The interesting thing about this, obviously, the, the town people were upset about this, about the, the black students wanting to attend a previously all-white school. They had the law on their side, though. The Supreme Court had said they could do this. This was something that, that was within their constitutional rights to do. The, the, the surprising part about this for me is that the Arkansas state governor, uh, instead of supporting the Constitution, he called out the National Guardsmen and prevented these nine students from attending the school. Um, there was a, a thousand townspeople that came out in protest, white people that came out and protested these black students attending. Eisenhower, finally, within about three weeks, Eisenhower needed to get involved. He's a president. and said, you know what? We will support the Supreme Court. We will support the Constitution of the United States. He ordered 10,000 National Guardsmen and 1,000 paratroopers to go to Central, or to Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and allow these students to attend high school. Now, one thing you've got to keep in mind, the Cold War was going on at this time. Uh, we were fighting the Soviets, uh, and, and world opinion was... What was better? Was communism better or was democracy better? And of course, we were making the case that democracy was better because of the, the personal freedoms that it afforded and that uh, communism did not afford those personal freedoms. Very interesting. Uh, Khrushchev, the, uh, the leader of the Communist Party, used a specific example of Little Rock, Arkansas, and told the rest of the world, you know, if democracy is so great, why won't they let their own students have freedoms to be able to attend the schools where they live closest to? Uh, so anyway, he, he used this as an example to, in the Cold War to, to, to show that how there was inequality within the United States. Sitting campaigns of 1960, this is a very simple thing that could be done. Uh, some students from North Carolina, some college students, decided if, to do their part where if they may not have a lot of money or the ability to organize, they, their part would be simply to sit at lunch counters in Woolworths department stores and they would wait until the waitress would serve them. Obviously, they were never served. Um, but this was, they would just come back the next day and just occupy the seats and, and, and wait for the waitress to serve them. Uh, the New York Times picked up on this story. This, the sitting campaigns was something that, that happened through the 60s and particularly through the 1970s is a very effective way for social change to happen by, by gathering attention and, and publicly, if needed to, publicly embarrass the companies to make a change. And Woolworths eventually was embarrassed enough that they did integrate the lunch counters and allowed people of color as well as white people to sit at the lunch counter. Freedom Riders in 1961. You may be familiar with the Freedom Riders with the W. It's a, a movie that's, that came out in the, the last few years. And the idea was it was based on, on these people um, that were the Freedom Riders. Their ideas were to integrate interstate bus transportation. Basically, uh, trailways and Greyhound buses as they would go from one city to another, from one state to another, very simple idea. If you're a person of color, when the bus gets to the next stop, let's go into the white-only waiting area. And as you can see from some of these pictures, it seems like a very simple idea and one that should, you should be able to, to very simply do. But all it would take is a couple phone calls up to the next stop saying, you know, we've got some Freedom Riders, we've got some guys on some buses, they're going to try to integrate. Have some people there and you can see for some of these Freedom Riders, 
Sometimes with police support, these mobs of people would attack the Freedom Riders. This is a very famous picture right here. Uh, you can see these, uh, there was black as well as white students who were part of these Freedom Ride movements. And you can see after an attack here of, of uh, what some of the people suffered, trying to simply integrate the bus lines. University of Mississippi in 1962, again, the Supreme Court in 54, it said that separate but equal was no longer valid doctrine. It, separate was inherently unequal. Yet still, still by 1962, there, were, there had been no black students at the University of Mississippi. In 1962, James Meredith enrolled in the University of Mississippi, and it wasn't simply that he could just go and attend school there. He needed federal marshals, you see on either side of him, to escort him to school because of the riots that were happening there within the city. Riots did happen. There were a couple people that were killed. Uh, Meredith was not one of those. He was protected. He was admitted and later did become the first black student to graduate from the university. But again, you can see 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, here, eight years later, still the colleges are not fully integrated. Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. Some of the most iconic images of the Civil Rights Movement came from the protests in Birmingham, Alabama. <clears throat> and you can see here uh, the picture of this young man. If I remember right, it was a 19-year-old 19 19-year-old uh, young man participating. And, and many of these people that, pro that participated in these protests were young. There were children. There were women in these crowds. Uh, tended to be a very young movement. Um, these protesters, it, what we're talking about here is people simply marching out of protest. They, it wasn't as if they were going through town, breaking windows, turning cars over. This was not a riot. This was a protest. Unfortunately, Birmingham was considered as one of the most racist, segregated cities in the South. And so that's why the civil rights leaders looked to Birmingham and said, this is where we need to go to have our protest. There was a public safety commissioner, very famous. His name was Bull Connor, very much a segregationist, very much a racist. During a protest in 1963, hundreds of the demonstrators were fined and imprisoned. When the jails were full, the police commissioner, the public safety commissioner, excuse me, he was in charge of the police as well as the fire department as a commissioner. He told the police, turn the attack dogs on the protesters he, and, and disperse the crowds, stop them from protesting. He also told the fire department, turn the fire hoses on the protesters to stop them from protesting. Images were broadcast across the country. They helped the civil rights movement gain sympathy. People who hadn't been paying attention to the civil rights movement saw a very one-sided fight that people peacefully protesting were being attacked, not by mobs, but by policemen and by firemen. It, it seemed exactly opposite of what people expected to see. It did help the civil rights movement. In 1963, under orders by City Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor, Birmingham, Alabama City Police used fire hoses and police dogs against children and adults engaged in nonviolent protests against segregation. The demonstrations were part of Martin Luther King Jr.'s Birmingham campaign. Television news coverage of the attacks by police sparked mass nationwide protests. Within a few months of the Birmingham marches, you had the March on Washington, D.C. in 1963. This was the largest march that had ever happened in Washington, D.C. And then the most famous speech of this march was Martin Luther King when he delivered the I Have a Dream speech. Most of us are familiar with 30, 45 seconds or so of that speech. Uh, the speech itself went on for about 10 minutes. A fantastic speech. It's easily found on YouTube. Um, and, and Martin Luther King really emerges from this march as the leader of the civil rights movement. Uh, shortly following the march on Washington, uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in, in Texas. Uh, his vice president, who became President Johnson, uh, took the opportunity and said, you know, JFK, what was important to, to John F. Kennedy was some civil rights legislation, and he helped pass some laws that JFK was working on. Uh, helped pass those through Congress. Uh, most importantly, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it outlawed segregation in public places, in schools, as well as employment. Uh, important to remember, it did not outlaw discrimination, uh, did now not outlaw racism, those still exist, but for, uh, importantly for the first time now on a federal level, it was illegal to segregate based uh, in public places, schools, and employment.